Thank you, Michael. I am very pleased to welcome you to this annual conference that is being held in critical times for the region. This is the most serious crisis for uh, all of the countries in recent memory. Countries are up against structural cha challenges that have been aggravated by the crisis and new challenges. The pandemic has revealed even more clearly inequality in Latin America, not just income inequality, but inequality in terms of access to public services and goods. We have seen in cases of corruption and problems of public administration in the healthcare system. This has had an impact on those who are most vulnerable and has taken away from government. Infrastructure gaps, particularly in the healthcare system and in digital infrastructure, has stood out during the pandemic. Issues of informality have created problems, especially as we've seen people under lockdown. How do we attend to the population by providing them direct cash transfers? Economic recovery is going to be slow and it is going to re it's going to be based on structures that are not standardized amongst countries. And so we're going to have to have more expansive fiscal and monetary policy. The possibility of implementing these policies to create jobs and increase productivity and the financial health of our economies more solid economic systems are going to be able to absorb this shock. This will be better for their bottom lines and in, in making credit available to activate the economy. We do have new challenges before us, digital transformation, climate change, geopolitical relations globally. We have to address these in a very consistent way, making the most of opportunities and mitigating risks. If not, inequality will grow in our region. How are we going to tackle these challenges? We have to do so pragmatically and through international cooperation. Like Amer Latin America was able to climb out of the 1980s financial crisis through fiscal and monetary policies that allowed them to build good policies. We must do the same in terms of social cohesion in our governments, particularly in terms of health and education. We need good regulations, internal processes, resources, human capital, but not conflating the tools with the objectives. We have to close the infrastructure gap, particularly the digital infrastructure gap, because of its need for education. This is going to require fiscal efforts and a great deal of international cooperation so that we can have long-term financing sources at concessional rates that will allow us to move forward in a sustainable manner as we tackle the challenges. There's also a problem in terms of integration, not as a political process, but as a useful tool for improving the well-being of our people. This conference is going to help us to generate ideas that are going to help us to tackle the challenges we have before us. Thank you so much for allowing me to participate. Thank you very much, President Carranza.
We are very honored today to have as our keynote speaker, the president of Uruguay, Luis Lacalle Paul. President Lacalle was born in 1973, and at age 47, he represents the vanguard of a new generation of leadership in Latin America. He began his political career in 2000 at the beginning of a new century when he was elected to represent a Uruguayan department, and then he was reelected for the next legislative terms. And he was the Speaker of the House of Representatives from 2011 to 2012. In 2014, he was elected Senator and was Senator from 2015 until 2019. On June 30th, 2019, he was elected for the National Party to, rep to be their candidate, leading a coalition of parties. He won the presidential elections in 2019, and he was inaugurated in March of 2020. His presidency began with the great challenge of the pandemic and th their adverse consequences on our societies and economies. I would like to note that Uruguay has played a central role in diplomacy and politics, not just in South America, but also in the Western Hemisphere for more than a century. Montevideo hosted the seventh Conference of American States in 1993 when at that time Secretary of State Cordel Hall articulated the good neighbor policy of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and that's when the relationship between the United States and the countries of the Americas began to improve. Uruguay, for more than a century, has played a core role in, bil in cooperation and collaboration. Diplomacy and wisdom is now in the hands of President Lacalle. President Lacalle, thank you very much for your time today, and we look forward to hearing your words. Thank you so much. Good morning, good afternoon. I would like to thank you for this invitation to take part in this very important conference. I've been looking at the list of speakers who will be speaking in these very difficult times that the planet is experiencing. And we'll hear some of the conclusions drawn by very intelligent and experienced individuals. That will be very important. I wanted to commend CAF and congratulate you on your 50th anniversary and point out the historic role you've played in our country and now especially in the context of the pandemic. I want to talk not specifically about what each country has done or what my country has done. I really want to talk about the learning and the new world we have before us. Our government it took office in March with a very proactive agenda with transformations in the government, in the public and private sectors. And 12 days later, we were up against the pandemic as it arrived in our country. We realized that there was not a single predictive model. There was no manual. And if you look at different countries and compare the laws, we started to see uneven results. First, we were looking at the different seasons. And so the Northern Hemisphere was in a different season than the Southern Hemisphere. But in both hemispheres, countries were seeing the same and uh, different outcomes. It was no longer a question of winter versus summer. And this is where we started to look at human behavior 
as the determinant of the deepest consequences of this pandemic. Along those lines, we started to work with a concept that I believe has taken on vital importance in these times. This is a concept that underlies any and every action that a government must implement. That is freedom. Freedom is the purest status of an individual. So you have to have a social freedom and liberty. It's got to be based on solidarity. We don't have different compartments. This is true globalization because at the end of the day, the world is a single place and any type of behavior at any place on the globe can unleash, in this case, negative consequences for all of humanity. And that means that generosity, solidarity is no longer voluntary, it is necessary. And that is why liberty must be part and parcel of each of the measures we take. Measures taken without any roadmap, without having any handbook or manual that told us how to handle the pandemic. Of course, countries that already had an infrastructure in place, a healthcare system that had reserves, could maintain a safety net that would help the effects of the pandemic to cause less harm. Of course, countries that had strong economies and those with access to credit had and have different opportunities as we weather the crisis. It's in our case, it was a healthy economy, but it is one with access to multilateral financial institutions, which we recurred to, re recurred to in these times when our economic resources were not enough. And I think that this is key as we talk about regional and international integration. We have to shore up the IFIs, not just from the perspective of capital and availability of capital, but also they must have a have to have a broader set of solutions or a bigger toolkit to address different situations. Because what's clear, what we all know, is that we are going to have to live with uncertainty. We are going to have to live in a new normal. And in our country, we have looked at how important science is that decision, political decisions have to have scientific underpinning. Science has taken on an even more important role in political decision making. And of course, running a country is not a scientific endeavor, but in a time of sicknesses and pandemics, you have to have a backup of scientific knowledge, we have to have academia, we have to have our scientists, and that is a blessing that we need to be grateful for. And also in solving problems. As we all look at eff effects that we were unaware of, and now we see a pattern how this disease is unfolding so that we can have answers and responses. So our countries in three months would be beginning the tourism season and this relies heavily on foreigners. We're in a continent where the spread of the disease is very big and so we have to be extremely careful if we start to think about opening up our borders so 
we've put together a group of scientists who have the tourism plan, the summer plan, so that they can come up with a way for our country to be able to let in tourists from other countries who want to spend some vacation time there. And this is something that has been recognized by our entire population. I would like to go back, however, to the concept of liberty. I've discussed this in other international forums. When the, pande when the pandemic came about, we all start had the duty to take care of ourselves, to, to go into lockdown. And the government does too. It's like a father of a big family that needs to protect its citizens. But it has to be comprehensive because if it's just about a lockdown, about quarantine, and that is a mandated, then we would be failing to pay attention to the other parts of people's lives that are also important. The matter of the economy for us was something key. Those individuals who live on the day-to-day, -day, they're day wage earners. If we were to suggest to them mandatory quarantine based on the pandemic, it could have a big impact. This could lead to a lower standard of living. This could lead to health care problems for those individuals and their families. We have to strike a balance between individual freedoms, the need to continue to operate, and taking care of our citizenry, which is also important. So how do we do this? We have to empower citizens, empower citizens' liberty. Uruguayans, the citizens of my country, have been exemplary in their response. If today it, the numbers in our country are acceptable vis-a-vis -vis other countries, it has nothing to do with the government. Is, this was a national effort and this was the responsible exercise of liberty by our citizens. This is something that we have for the future governments that are not afraid of empowering their citizens, that are not afraid of providing information and being transparent with their citizens. That's something that builds confidence and trust. That is another one of the tools that we have so that we can work on uncertainty looking forward. If we have discourse and actions that are transparent, this creates trust and trust leads to action and then we've created a virtuous circle. So now I would like to talk about the economy as a consequence of this pandemic. This crisis has almost exceeded the recession of 2009, and all countries have suffered as a result of the situation. Some will have different curves, but what we do know is like any crisis, the consequences tend to fall on a significant group of citizens. Today, we have a group of citizens that have had their income fallen because they don't have their monthly salaries. That's where we have to work. Let's end the orthodox concept that a state has a social sensibility or it's orthodox. The decisions and actions should come up according to what it's happened Let's leave the orthodoxy for the academicians, and those who are governing should know that academics and science will provide what we need at different times. And regarding the economic situation in the world, what I mentioned before, that obligation of protecting my citizens, the Uruguayans, any 
person in gov any president should do with his citizens. These situations or any action could lead in any country that has the ability to self-sustain, if there is such a country, you have to create protection measures. And that's where the economy has to make a great, great effort or sacrifice. I spoke to President Xi Jinping and I said, I proposed we what I just mentioned. We have spoken to the government of the United States along the same lines. And I can say confidently that the great nations are open or they have a vocation to be open and that for developing nations is very important. An integrated and globalized world that taught us more quickly than we expected to obtain other sources of res for resources and to live a different way needs an open world. A free and open world will be better in the end for humanity. And from this corner of the world, that is what we will be expressing at every level. This also shows something that is very human and that we are living daily when we look at our children and our loved ones. And that is that life is fragile and we never know when it will end. So we must live it intensely. And that also then transfers or translates to relationships amongst nations. We have seen how in a certain way the World Trade Organization has stopped or frozen what it's been doing with agreements between countries. We're going towards, or I should say, we already are in a world where supply and demand is rapidly happening and it has to be satisfied as quickly as it emerges. And politics is what is mediating. It is not a pure relationship. Politics is in the middle, the mediator. And we, as governing bodies, have to complement and balance supply and demand. We have to be the mediators. In that sense, I think that the possibility of looking for market niches and quotas to be satisfied is a response that governments have to give to the private sector, to those who propel the production in our countries. So this is how Uruguay has stood in the world with its strengths. This is how Uruguay extends its liberty and sovereignty within its borders and also with the self-assurance of a nation and state that has firm institutions to have relationships with the rest of the world. With this, you can count on our country for, for this. And you can count on our country, I said, not our government, because our government will end in four years. But this idea of being open, solidarious, and to have a relationship with Uruguay is much more than the idea of a president or a political party. It is in our genes. It's, it's part of our essence as a nation from many years ago. This is why we participate in an inclusive of a nationalism, not a refractory nationalist nationalism. It is born in the roots of who we are, our identity as a nation, but that instead of closing us in, allows us to be sure, knowing who we are, that we will openly have relations with the rest of the world. So taking advantage of this opportunity in these moments with a pandemic still developing that does not allow us to loosen our guard. L 
and other countries that seemingly had controlled the situation and where they were doing follow-up on all the people that had been part of the contagion now has been researching. So we have to control the health situation, but we must also know that this teaches us many things and creates opportunities. And that is the way Uruguay is heading towards and once more thanking the CAF and tightening and strengthening our links and relationships. Good afternoon and good day to all. Thank you very much, President Lacalle Poe. I like the phrase when you say, in defense of an open and free world. And that is what you're.
It's 5 p.m. in Madrid, it's 10 p.m. in Bogota a.m. and 11 a.m. in Washington, D.C. And we are back and ready to begin our first session of the conference and the last session of the day, titled Economic Recovery from COVID-19 and the Future of the Social Contract. Remember that you can participate via Twitter using our conference hashtag DialogoCAF2020. It is now my pleasure to introduce our lead off speaker of our first session, Luis Felipe Lopez Calva. Luis Felipe is the regional director for Latin America and the Caribbean at the United Nations Development Program. He has held several top positions at the UNDP and at the World Bank, including practice manager of the poverty and equity global practice. He formerly served as chair of the Network on Inequality and Poverty in the Latin America and Caribbean Economic Association. Luis Felipe, good luck. Over to you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. It is really a privilege to lead off uh, and moderate today's discussion in this session on economic recovery from COVID-19 and the future of the social contract. This is, of course, the first session today uh, here uh, in, in the US within the 24th annual CAF conference. Thanks to the partnership of CAF, uh, the Development Bank of Latin America, the Inter-American Dialogue, and the OAS, it has become a tradition uh, to gather every year to talk about the challenges and opportunities uh, in our region. I will start by introducing briefly uh, our uh, stellar panelists even though, of course, uh, none of them really required uh, uh, an introduction. So let me start with uh, uh, Alicia Barcena. She's Executive Secretary of the United Nations uh, Commission, Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean uh, since 2008. She previously uh, served as Under Secretary General for Management and uh, Chief of Cabinet uh, of former Secretary General Kofi Annan at the United Nations headquarters. She has also served as Deputy Executive Secretary and Director of ECLAC's Environment and Human Settlements Division. She has been awarded honorary degrees from the University of Oslo, the University of Havana, and the National University uh, in Mexico. Rebecca Greenspan uh, is the Secretary General uh, at the Ibero-American General Secretariat. Uh, Prior to this position, she has been vice president uh, in Costa Rica, uh, in which uh, position in which she also coordinated the minister's uh, uh, cabinet uh, for social and economic sectors, housing and human settlements. Uh, she was also the vice minister of finance. Uh, Rebecca Greenspan has also served as UN Under Secretary General, Associate Administrator of the United Nations Development Program and Director of the United Nations Development Program's uh, Regional Bureau for Latin America and the Caribbean. Carmen Reinhardt was uh, recently appointed as Vice President of Development Economics and Chief Economist of the World Bank Group. She is on public service leave from Harvard Kennedy School, where she is the uh, Minos uh, Sobanakis Professor of International Financial System. Previously, she was Senior Policy Advisor and Deputy Director at the International Monetary Fund and held positions as Chief Economist and Vice President at the investment bank Bear Stearns. In 2018, she has awarded the King Juan Carlos Prize in Economics and the Naves Adam Smith Award, among other very important uh, recognitions. Paula Santilli uh, is the CEO of PepsiCo Latin America and the former president of PepsiCo Mexico Foods. Within 20, uh, with 20 year uh, experience uh, in the corporate uh, world, she leads the company's food and beverage business across the region. Paula is committed to generate inclusive growth in Latin America. In 2019, she was included in Fortune's 50 most powerful women international list and in Forbes 100 most powerful women. And last but of course not least, uh, Professor Joseph Stiglitz. She's an economist and professor at Columbia University, a recipient of the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics Science and the John Bates Clark Medal. He's former senior vice president and chief economist at the World Bank, 
former member and chairman of the uh, U.S. President's Council of Economic Advisors. He's also the co-chair of the high-level expert group on the measurement of economic performance and social progress at the OECD. With this stellar panel, uh, we have a very promising conversation. I will make three points just to lead off uh, to, to our uh, uh, dialogue with the panelists. First, as we know, COVID-19 uh, has hit the region uh, really harshly. Actually, uh, Latin America is the region uh, uh, that will suffer the most from this pandemic, according to estimates and forecasts. The IMF and the ECLAC have estimated very uh, large decreases in output employment, trade, and very important increases in poverty uh, at, the, uh, you know, at the level of, of the, the scale of 45 to 50 million people at least. So in the same way in which the pandemic uh, hits um, individuals uh, who can, uh, have this, this uh, uh, disease, uh, according to pre-existing conditions, countries also have uh, pre-existing conditions. In our region, Low productivity, very high inequality, high levels of exclusion, and low trust in governments. It's precisely those uh, 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 pre-existing conditions that have made the impact of this crisis even deeper. So with this perspective, we need to build a better uh, uh, normal and to recover and go even beyond recovery. And that is the intention of today's conversation. Do we really have an opportunity to rethink the agreements among Latin American actors to build more inclusive and more sustainable societies. Social contracts can mean several things, but three characteristics are in the literature. One is you have, they have to be sustainable economically, socially, and environmentally. Second, they have to be fair. People have to perceive that they are fair because a contract can only be valid among equals. And finally, uh, they have to induce voluntary compliance. We don't want people to exit using Hirschman's concept, the social contract. So we want people to be part voluntarily of that social uh, contract. So this is quite a challenge. So do we have the conditions for that? So we start with you, Alicia, uh, because you have worked with your teams in assessing the impact of, of the crisis and you have uh, estimated very, very important economic construction and a reduction uh, in, in trade of uh, about 23% in, uh, in, uh, for the region. And this has a large impact uh, in our economies. So what are some of, recommenda of the recommendations for the region to rebound from this steep contraction and to build economic resilience uh, in the long term? The floor is yours, Alicia. Thank you so much, uh, Luis Felipe. I'm going to speak in Spanish, so let me turn so I, 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 I made the interpreters aware. La, la pandemia ha reflejado y ha revelado la fragilidad de la globalización y el multilateralismo. Se trata the fragility de una crisis of the world de in a systemic way. It is a systemic crisis as far as supply and demand. So we must find a new development paradigm under the premise of sustainability socioeconomically. And this goes with the 2030 agenda. I think that we need a progressive structural change and more than speaking of anything else, it should be a transformation with innovation, but also always centering and focusing on equality and development. So this is an exceptional moment where we are redefining what is possible. We're much more open to change the status quo and political change. So in that sense, it is an opportunity. We can seriously speak of a basic income that the government can pay, socioeconomic and national, regionally and globally, we must change and a very fair, inclusive and progressive social contract. In our reports, we have seen that this crisis has magnified the gaps and we have pointed out 10 very harsh realities that we must talk about to reconstruct. 
9,1 First, la caída the most, del, del PIB, the worst la región, contraction además, economically in 100 years, exports el, el is less than, are less than 23 percent, and 44 million will be unemployed, poverty is increasing, 45 million people more will fall into poverty, and 96 million will be in extreme poverty total. Many of these are women. This is is the la part of society that is the sector that is most affected. The most delicate as far as the supply is 2.7 small and medium-sized enterprises will close down. So we have analyzed the digital aspect and 40 million homes are not connected to the internet and have no access to internet, at least of good quality. And the great majority are, of course, within the poverty line. So 32 million children, girls, and adolescents cannot study in that manner. So we have economic and socially lost a decade. So we've seen that 33 million people will go below median income into poverty. So eight out of 10 people in the region, 490 million will require a basic income and different policies. So what measures are we proposing? We have proposed to stimulate the supply with an environmental and sustainability focus, creating jobs which is central to strengthen the economy. And we are studying what sectors could create a greener economy, renewable, transportation, mobilization, and these basic sectors. We understood that health does as a region is little is being invested in health, way below what we are investing in paying our foreign debt, our external debt. So people that are in poverty need $150 a month for $230 million people complemented with a bonus against hunger. Para la oferta, measures to stimulate the supply, we have to finance and support these medium and small sized enterprises and micro businesses. So de, de we have suggested extensions or giving some relief from taxes and redistributing policies universal, that will protect universal Universally, all people, especially in health, and there we need a government program that is more progressive and effective that will eliminate Taxes, so that there is no evasion, que, eh, no llega tax evasion. So definitely, we also must increase taxes in many countries and regressive taxes of the one rich percent should pay them. No where el BEPS, these productivity bien, gains pero hay que are taken, hacerlo donde hace we la have to do it where supuesto, there is a gain in productivity. Mucho más, eh, and this, of course, Hemos hecho means otra a more inclusive Felipe, public sobre cómo dotar a todos los spending. Hogares we de, also de, have de un, to give un, all homes y hemos or make them all an inclusive digital Realmente society. Dotar a todos One los percent que no of de GMP una is digital. should hemos visto do que esto this. So we have a basic la financiera, la digital, digital Así inclusion. Es de que y por so, último, yo diría, tenemos finally, que hablar de que los gobiernos no van a poder sostener este gasto fiscal y, este, y esta inversión tan grande que están haciendo ya. Hoy los gobiernos están invirtiendo alrededor de 3.9% y 10% de la garantía, pero va a requerirse de una cooperación internacional. Se requieren acuerdos multilaterales para proveer a las sociedades y globales, que son la salud, la paz, la estabilidad financiera, la seguridad that is economic and social stability, an economy of care. We must understand that women have to be recognized and revalued. And finally, I 
región what is relevant es cómo vamos to the a confrontar una nueva geografía económica mundial en donde hay menor interdependencia en la producción, el comercio y la tecnología. Hoy vamos al presidente de Uruguay diciendo que queremos sociedades más abiertas y tal, pero la realidad es que el mundo se está reorganizando en tres regiones, Norteamérica, Europa y Asia Pacífico, y va a haber cada día más confrontación en términos de disputas comerciales y tecnológicas. Así es que nuestra región tiene que entender cómo va a bajarse, cómo se va a relacionar en nuestra nueva geografía económica. La integración regional deja mucho que desear. Estamos muy fragmentados We en nuestra región. Fragmented Realmente el comercio intrarregional ha caído en forma muy estrepitosa. Del 20, ha, ha caído un 28% solamente en el último año. Y ya estaba más o menos en 13. Cuando and en Europa it was estamos at about 13%, en 60%, en, en, en Asia Pacífico en está en 45, o sea, lo que la región le vende a la propia región so es menor al 13%. Entonces, sí tenemos que re recalibrar, recalcular. Y, y yo diría, las Naciones so Unidas y, y el PNUD y nosotros y todos, estamos trabajando hacia la construcción de un nuevo pacto en materia de financiamiento para el desarrollo, en donde realmente se pueda recapitalizar las instituciones multilaterales financieras en donde se pueda lograr la eh, provisión de derechos especiales de giro, o por lo menos la reubicación de los que existen hoy día. Y creo que sobre todo en nuestra región tenemos que apoyar a las pequeños estados insulares del Caribe y de Centroamérica, que son los dos, yo diría, países que más ayuda requieren y creo que este proceso que el Secretario General ha llevado adelante con el Primer Ministro de Jamaica y el Primer Ministro de Canadá puede lograr resultados tangibles después de la reunión de Uruguay con el Ministro de Finanzas. Creo que hay elementos para transformar justamente esta dinámica. Así es que el pacto social, político, económico, fiscal y un pacto global para la provisión de beneficios. Thank agreement you, for the provision of public funds. I think uh, uh, that shows uh, two issues that we have been stressing. One is this is a systemic uh, uh, shock, and the second, it, it really requires to rethink uh, rules and policies, agreements uh, among different actors in, in, in every context. So, Rebecca Greenspan, um, in this context, uh, you know, governments are having to respond very rapidly and decisively uh, in the very short term, but as you always say, the short term and the long term start at the same time. So whatever decisions are being made now uh, will affect uh, the nature of the recovery. So what are these characteristics that a more cohesive uh, social contract uh, should have, or we should aim at uh, having uh, as countries emerge from the crisis uh, to create this new and better normal? Rebecca, the floor is yours. Um, yes, now? Yes, uh, please, go ahead. Perfect. So thank you so much, Luis Felipe, and it's a pleasure to be here. So we, have, uh, in, we don't have much time, so let me start with a fundamental truth that we'll be, we will be facing on January 1st, 21, when Latin Americans will wake up to an economy that is almost 10% smaller than it was only a year before. And as we heard from you and from Alicia, almost 40 million of them will return to poverty with 26 million in extreme poverty, something that uh, we know that in Latin America translate directly into hunger. So this means that for the first time since 2010, the average person in Latin America will be poor, as opposed to middle class. Uh, they also, the citizens of the region, will wake up with children that have asymmetrically lost a big part of their year studies, raising inequality in education, women overburdened by domestic work again, and feeling most of them still uncertain about the future. Workers as well as businesses, because we will have high numbers of unemployment and 3 million formal companies that will have closed. And probably we will wake up in a very polarizing environment. 
since many of the countries will be closer to elections because in 2021, we start what we call the electoral super cycle in Latin America. So even in the most optimistic scenario, one in which we begin to recover in the second semester of this year, with a vaccine for COVID being available sometime in 2021, the dream of a short-term crisis in a V-shaped recovery is almost dead. As we feared, Latin America will suffer hysteresis. Short-term issues will have evolved into long-term ones. Indeed, I think the IMF forecasts a recovery in 2021 of less than 4% uh, for the region, a very small fraction of what we will lose this year. So simmering below this new panorama are long-standing issues, as you said before, that the region was already dealing be, uh, uh, before uh, the pandemic hit. But let me add to what you have said, Luis Felipe, that, uh, uh, the, the, that we were experiencing an increase in popular dissatisfaction with democracy and inequality, something that led to huge protest in 2019. So I think that these protests are now paused by the lockdowns, but they will surely return. So uh, let me uh, try to uh, uh, get into what we think as a social contract, because uh, uh, we have no way of uh, uh, saying this lightly, on January 1st next year, Latin Americans will wake up to a dramatic panorama. And this is where is the question, where the question of a new social contract comes into play. And as we know, the idea of rebuilding a new social contract is not new, but this time it really is different. This time around, the status quo simply cannot survive. Therefore, we only have two options. We either solve these problems together as a society via a new social contract, or we wake or we make these problems worse by doubling down on polarization, frustration, and short-term thinking. In other words, I think now a new social contract is not simply a wish, but a necessity. So what elements should be part of this social contract? The first of them is to restore trust. This was very clear in the address of President Lacalle today. A big part of Uruguay's success was that the citizens trust their institutions and their political system. This is a prerequisite to reach a new consensus. And I am not using the word consensus. I am using the word consensus intentionally since we need a new consensus, not only at the national level, but also at the international level. And I hope that many of you will be talking about that. Latin America cannot go into a social contract without having the backing of the uh, international finance institutions and, and the development banks. We won't be able to go out of this crisis alone. So let me uh, 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 go back to, to the conditions, the, uh, nationally, a uh, condition uh, to restore trust, particularly uh, uh, having a focus on reducing inequality and increasing the public space, including the role of the state. But the revalorization of the public state is not, of the public uh, space, sorry, is not a revalorization of the state is also what we build together. And I think that that should be clear since we need the private sector, we need social, uh, 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 civil society and a citizenship to be part of this social contract. A second element of the new social contract is that it must be inclusive. It must champion women and youth and invest strongly in basic social services. This is the only way to dismantle the time bomb that is the current level of frustration with democracy in the region. A third element is that it must think long-term 
uh, as you said, uh, my favorite phrase, <laughs> uh, big pro green growth. That's the transformative economy we have to go uh, to go for and pro employment. For this, we'll need to dramatically increase investment in physical and digital infrastructures, promote regional integration, upskill our workforce, and help our SMEs. Fourth element is that it needs to champion a fiscal reform, like Alicia was saying. And, and we will need to increase the fiscal base by fighting tax evasion, corruption, and informality, and by putting in place more progressive tax and antitrust regimes. We are the most unequal region in the world, and this is a huge obstacle for our economic prospects and our social cohesion. And lastly, let me say that the new social contrast must be green, as I said before, and promote sustainability in the 2030 agenda. It won't be easy. It will require a lot of work, a lot of dialogue, and most importantly, let me say a lot of leadership. I think that never before uh, our future depends, depended so much on the quality of leadership at this time. And leadership not only from government, but also, as I said, from private sectors and a, a civil society. Without good leadership and quality leadership, it will be very difficult to get to the agreements uh, that we need for a transformative agenda, but also a just and fair uh, 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 agenda, as you said before, Luis Felipe. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, I think uh, uh, one of the elements to to uh, make this uh, to reach these new agreements um, certainly is the trust and the issues that have been uh, mentioned in, in this conversation. But also, it requires so certain levels of certainty and uh, and and resources. Uh, so the fiscal aspects also matter. So Carmen, Carmen Reinhardt, um, you recently mentioned in a, in an article in Foreign Affairs that there are indicators that suggest that globally the path towards recovery will be long uh, and that really matters for for all these also to be to be to be possible so do you think the recovery will be long for latin america carmen the floor is yours uh i think the oh, i think the recovery will be long period i think it will be particularly long for latin america Latin America has been hit especially hard. Uh, but I, that doesn't imply that I think that a V-shape or anything resembling a V-shape uh, is in the making for the global economy at large. Uh, the article you mentioned made the point, don't confuse rebound with recovery, that you know, for a lot of indicators, because we've had massive collapses this year, you're going to see you know, a snapback, but if you look at per capita incomes, uh, you know, we are talking, you know, upward of five years to get back uh, to the pre-crisis level. Um, you know, I, I think, as I said, so I'm, I'm, I'm worried about the global outlook and I'm, and I'm especially worried about uh, Latin America. Both Alicia and Rebecca have lucidly illustrated and discussed a lot of the challenges. Uh, I will mention two more and a third one that is probably the most worrisome. The two more I'm gonna mention is, and these haven't been mentioned, Latin America continues to be as commodity dependent today as probably as it was in the 19th century. Uh, and, and, and so the global commodity cycle has played also a very important role in shaping the fate of the region. Uh, that, you know, the, the, the 2008, 2009 global financial crisis, it was really a crisis in 11 advanced economies. And, you know, it hit uh, emerging markets hard, but emerging markets rebounded sharply in large part in the case of Latin America, especially because, you know, China was growing at double digits commodity markets as a consequence of that rapid growth and a lot of that growth was, was commodity intensive was really nothing but good news in the region. And, and at the time, you know, there, there was a lot of optimism 
you know, in places like Brazil, how, how inequality and poverty were looking a lot better. Uh, but those gains turned out to be transient. So, so you know, I, I, one issue I wanted to issue, we we're, we're, we're continue to be dependent on, on commodities. We continue to be dependent on Latin America on external finance, uh, which is, you know, volatile capital, fl capital flows, you know, are, are, are a chronic feature uh, in the region and, and expensive foreign finance. Um, you know, during this crisis, probably the single bond that has carried the highest coupon was floated by El Salvador, nine and a half percent for a bond uh, when rates are close to zero. So, you know, the dependence on commodities, the dependence on, 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 on external finance are also big challenges. In addition to all the things that, that Alicia and Rebecca have mentioned, what worries me even more about all of this is that we could have had this conversation 20 years ago and all these factors would have been listed. Uh, and we could have maybe had it 40 years ago, certainly, and, you know, remember the 80s, how, how well they worked out for, for the region. Um, so so I, I, I think, you know, uh, the, the fact that these challenges span decades and decades and decades is, 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 is very troubling. And so I'm not going to offer, you know, like, you know, how, how we're going to revamp, you know, a new model for the region. I, I really, I, I, don't, I wouldn't know what to say. One area that I would like to say something that the region should prepare for, and, and this is not just Latin America specific, but I think it hit Latin America hard in the context of your question, going back to the question of how swift the recovery is, you know, understandably, we're all worried about the health crisis and the output collapses and the surge in unemployment and the surge in poverty. But behind this is a quieter uh, uh, financial crisis lurking, meaning, you know, the banks uh, hit are being hit by, you know, you know, how many of those small businesses or households will be able to repay debts. So what I'm saying is that there, you know, and this cuts across regions and it cuts across income levels too. You know that that I think, you know, I, I'm worried about the frailty of the banking system because I think we're in for another credit crunch, and credit crunch is a headwind to recovery. Um, so I think, a, you know, policymakers in the region would would really do well to start thinking about, you know, how to, how to, you know, restructure the existing uh, uh, non-performing assets that are likely to come out of this. You know, right now in a lot of countries in our region and in others uh, are under almost a state of suspension because, you know, many, in many places, you, you know, Households and firms have grace periods, uh, so payments aren't being made, and it's hard to know what's insolvent and what's illiquid. But I think by next year, uh, we will be facing, you know, a new wave in the same or or, or or a financial problem that is a byproduct of everything that's happening this year. Um, but in, most importantly, most importantly. Uh, my, my concern is that that will be yet another headwind uh, to recovery, uh, you know, uh, recovering without credit, recovering when, when households and firms are trying to delever, and recovering generally in a, in a period in which I think just international resources are going to be a lot, a lot scarcer for the region. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, thank you, pa uh, Paula. Uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, the reaching new agreements among different actors in society. We're talking about uh, resources that are needed, fiscal space limited, um, uh, social protection systems that are fragmented. There is an important role that uh, the private sector could play and corp the uh, corporations can play. Um, 
potentially in this construction of, of the new social contract? What do you think the private sector's role could be in this recovery and the construction of this new social contract uh, to, to build a, a new normal that is more inclus inclusive and more, more resilient? Uh, the floor is yours, Paula. Yes, uh, Luis Felipe, thank you. Um, I have to agree that most of my colleagues here on the panel have pictured a very grim situation for Latin America. And as a business leader of a huge um, company with an enormous footprint in Latin America, we have over 70,000 direct uh, employees in Latin America. We do everything from go to the little stores up and down the streets of every single city in Latin America. We do farming and agro work with thousands and thousands of little agro and, and growers. Um, I have one important premise for all of us, the 4,000 people, maybe uh, Luis Felipe on this call. We as leaders have the obligation of putting out there an optimistic tone a willingness of knowledge that we will rebuild growth, that we will bring prosperity back to the families in Latin America. At least, eh, Luis Felipe, that is my personal commitment and that of my company in PepsiCo. No? We believe that if we leaders are you know, knowledgeable about the difficult situation, I'm not denying any of the numbers that the people here have carefully uh, crafted, those are very strong facts. However, I think we need to be optimistic. I think the families in Latin America are waiting for leadership that can bring uh, ideas and plans to execute growth and, and bring prosperity, inclusiveness, sustainable growth, to all those families out there. Okay, so that's what you have, number one, from me. Please, let's bring an optimistic view. Number two, uh, this is an extraordinary opportunity for Latin America to be completely transformational, completely transformational. And all of us together, business number one, have to help governments think exactly where are the resources necessary to completely transform our um, countries. No? Do we have to look at new industries that do not exist in Latin America today? For example, digital industries. No, I think Alicia mentioned that. Do we have to reinvent agro industries? Can we become um, uh, the feeders of the world in Latin, uh, from Latin America? No, industrial agro products are something we can do so well. The other one is tourism, for example. Anyway, the message here is we need to look at what we have today, whether it's health infrastructure, education, or businesses, and together look at what are those industries that can bingo, bring those um, growth needs uh, quickly to Latin America. Finally, Luis Felipe, we as industries, we want to seat at the table. You know? We want to collaborate with governments, with NGOs, with organisms like the ones you represent. And let's talk, because at business, as business people, there are a few things we can do well, and that is we can you know, set a vision, uh, decide on a strategy, and develop and execute plans, you know, do the real fundamentals on the ground that create and materialize that vision. So let us help you, you know, um, let us talk together um, in a very collaborative fashion, maybe a lot more than what Latin America has seen in the past. So sometimes, and it depends on the government, we have governments that are very business friendly, others are not so much. So, you know, maybe it's time to bring down those old prejudices of the past and, um, and, and work together to set a new optimistic growth uh, opportunity for Latin America. Luis Felipe, to end, my four grandparents uh, came in a boat to Latin America from Europe. 
okay? They were fleeing from horrible um, situations in the old continent. They came with nothing, okay? And they came in a boat, they landed on the shores of Latin America, and they built um, a, who we are in Latin America today. I feel a little like my grandparents, no? Today is a marvelous, marvelous opportunity to jump on a boat that might be different, might be scary, but that will certainly take us to a better journey. Luis Felipe, myself personally as a business leader, the company I lead today in Latin America, we are willing to be on the boat and to create a beautiful, huge wake that creates prosperity for more and more families in Latin America. And we will do that with humbleness, but also with an enormous amount of optimism. Thank you, Paula. Uh, very powerful message. Uh, Professor Stiglitz, we, we have seen a very complicated context and some uh, ideas on how to turn this into an opportunity. We we'll always look uh, at the US as a fundamental intellectual reference uh, in, in our region. Just to mention something, your recent uh, role in the renegotiation of, of the Argentine uh, uh, debt. And uh, so there is, this is not time for orthodoxy. We need very decisive and ambitious responses from governments, but this requires a coordinated effort and it requires the support of the international community and the financial uh, uh, sector. Uh, how do you think the financial systems uh, internationally can support countries uh, in financing this response that, as we heard, will be long, and, and the recovery actions uh, to this pandemic. Uh, please, uh, Professor Stiglitz, the floor is yours. Yes, well, I think we've had a very good description of uh, how uh, deep the crisis is, um, a vision of what we could do, uh, what Latin America can do uh, to get out of it, um, the impact on national budgets has been enormous, on national deficits has been uh, enormous. Uh, even uh, in countries like the United States, our, our deficit GDP, our debt GDP ratio uh, will reach uh, over 100% uh, uh, any month. And uh, the numbers of our deficit to GDP ratio are numbers. Uh, 15 percent or more that uh, have no, almost never been heard of from uh, advanced countries. So, uh, and for developing countries and emerging markets in Latin America, uh, it's it's a real challenge. So, first, uh, it the cost of not doing anything is far greater than the cost of doing something. So, I think we are right in the United States to have had a massive program of $3 trillion and, and roughly $3 trillion from the Federal Reserve. And I think Latin America, uh, those Latin American countries that have recognized the, the magnitude of the challenge and have done respond to are doing uh, the right thing. But the fact that uh, it is having uh, budgetary implications has two consequences. The first is we have to be very careful in the design. And when I say we, every country has to be very careful in the design of the programs. Uh, they have to be targeted, they have to be timely, they have to be very sensitive to the differences uh, across individuals, firms, sectors. So just to highlight one thing that we've discovered in the United States, our country is very badly divided in many, many ways. One way is that a very large part of the country is living paycheck to paycheck, roughly half. And the moment they get the money, they spend it. And if they don't get the money, they don't spend it. Uh, that means money going to these groups is very stimulative to the economy, and if we don't give it, the social consequences are enormous. Uh, and, and Alicia has talked about some of those social consequences. On the other hand, 
the people at the top have a very large cushion. You know, remarkable thing about what has happened is the average, average savings rate in the United States last quarter was 25 percent. This is in a country where the normal savings rate has been zero, one, two, three, four, five percent, but never 25 percent. So, uh, and you realize that half the population are saving, saving zero. That means the other half that's like saving 25 percent is saving uh, even uh, is saving is that the average is 25 you're saving even more than that so we have to be very sensitive to how we spend the money and uh, the United States didn't do a very good job uh, in spite of spending three trillion dollars the unemployment rate is sore there are a lot of people who are very vulnerable and that message is even more important for Latin America uh, the part of directing your attention is making sure that health is number one uh, and protecting the vulnerable. Uh, and again, these were deficiencies in response here in the United States. Another implication, though, of the fact that money is so tight is that we have to make the money that we spend do dual purpose, and sometimes triple purpose. And by that, I mean we have to build back the economy, to use the word Biden has put, build back the economy better. Uh, the crisis has exposed, uh, if we weren't aware of it before, a lot of the problems, a lack of resilience, but most importantly, uh, of the inequalities uh, they, it, that are very deep in our societies. So we have to make sure that the money we spend is... Uh, serving multiple purposes. And one of the key issues is dealing with climate change. If we don't, we're going to be facing another crisis in the coming uh, years. So it is absolutely imperative to use the money that we're spending to help create, uh, uh, facilitate the green transition. And some of the research that I've done with Nick Stern and uh, Cameron Hepburn at Oxford has pointed out that one can spend the money in a very effective way, timely, cost-effective, labor-intensive, in supporting the green transition. So uh, that's uh, the second message that comes out of the out of the uh, uh, fact that uh, uh, we are going to be facing uh, fiscal challenges internationally, though. You know, we're all in the same boat together. We, the pandemic has shown that we're uh, that the disease goes across, that virus goes across borders. Uh, carbon dioxide molecules go across borders, uh, and we have a global economy today. And so we won't recover from the pandemic, and we won't uh, recover economically until the whole world is recovery. And therefore, I believe very strongly it's in the international community's interest to make sure that every part of the world recovers. And it was pointed out uh, after 2008, there was a strong Chinese recovery that helped pull up uh, uh, Latin America, the commodity prices. That's not likely to happen. Uh, China is going to be doing better than uh, much of the rest of the world, but it's not going to be doing great. And the what it's going to do, uh, be doing uh, already indicates that it uh, won't be importing the magnitudes uh, that it did uh, in the 2008 crisis. So I don't think the world can rely on that. Now, um, there are some instruments, and uh, the IMF has shown uh, uh, a leadership and the multilateral development banks have some, some leadership. One thing is an issuance of $500 billion of SDRs. That can be done without going back to the parliaments. Uh, and uh, there's a broad consensus over that. And one country is holding it up. And I won't tell you which country uh, that is, but I think you could probably figure that out. Uh, no reason, no good reason for that. And hopefully, uh, come a new administration in Washington, uh, that will change. In fact, 
there's been a uh, uh, bill submitted to Congress to go beyond the $500 billion to $2 trillion of SDRs. And many of the European countries have made a commitment to donate or lo- lend their SDRs to the emerging markets and least developed countries that need it. So the good news is, and you want to be optimistic, uh, as Paula said, the good news is that there are there are a lot of uh, people who understand the importance of global solidarity, and uh, they've said, here's an instrument we have, and we will make we, we will contribute our our support for this. Uh, there has been. Uh, um, you know, uh, Carmen emphasized the, the problems of, of uh, a, a looming financial crisis, and that's also true at the international scale. Uh, there are many countries that are, will not be able to pay their debts. There's been uh, a G20 resolution uh, uh, for a stay for the least developed countries in debt payments, but it has to be far broader than that. Uh, That stay was just for the least developed countries and only for the official debt. And unfortunately, in recent years, uh, there's been a lot of private lending, and the private creditors have not been very cooperative, unfortunately, and uh, have seen this as an opportunity to extract a pound of flesh and... uh, uh, things have, you know, uh, in some cases they've gone better. Uh, Argentina did manage to, to, to get a resolution, but uh, some of the countries have, have, have faced, uh, let me say, much more difficulties. So uh, we need a not only a much more comprehensive stay on the debt, there's going to be a lot of restructuring that's going to be needed. And we should have created an international bankruptcy framework for sovereign debt along the lines that the UN adopted in 2015, overwhelmingly, with only a few countries opposed. But uh, unfortunately, some of the countries opposing were some of the critical countries. And again, that has not uh, proceeded in the way uh, that it should. Uh, Finally, let me just say that um, in the run up to the 2008 crisis, there was a lot of discussion of a savings glut. Uh, in uh, recent years, interest rates have been near zero. Uh, what is clear is that there's a lot of savings available. There's a lot of long term investments that would help the recovery in the constructive way that we want the green transition, address some of the infrastructure problems, very strong in Latin America. Uh, But standing between these long-term funds, people who, sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, and the long-term needs of investment are short-sighted financial markets. And the multilateral development banks have played a critical role in moving towards uh, longer-term investment. Um, And CAF has played a very important role in that. And so uh, I think uh, this is really a moment where there needs to be a further recapitalization, further strengthening of the multilateral development banks Because what we need now as part of this recovery is more long-term vision. And uh, that long-term vision, which includes a green transition and more inclusive growth, uh, is what will enable us to have a stronger recovery from the pandemic. Thank you very much. Uh, I take from this very rich conversation that... uh... We, we can turn this into an opportunity, but it's not going to happen spontaneously. We need to be proactive. We, have, we, want to go, we need to come up with ideas and, uh, and to create coalitions uh, uh, to, to, to push for certain things. Uh, so we will merge this second round uh, to, to be able to also hear from uh, questions from the audience. 
uh, to try to give an opportunity uh, for the panelists to speak again, but based on the questions from from uh, uh, all the um, uh, people that are participating. So I and I, if you don't mind when uh, your responses, I will step in just to make sure to that we have shorter answers and we can uh, go around the, 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 all the panelists. So. Uh, I want to give the floor to our master of ceremonies uh, to uh, to guide us through through the questions of the audience. Please. Uh, thank you, Luis Felipe. Uh, we have many questions. Let's see how much time do we have left. Um, we have one from Colombia, uh, David uh, Genovich. Um, he asked, "Do you think the new social contract will inevitably lead to a greater state participation in economic and social decisions?" Do you think this will imply more collective decision making, collective capital allocation? Um, okay, so maybe I don't know if uh, because of uh, the first session, if, if uh, Rebecca and Alicia would like to respond, maybe you, Rebecca, first. Eh, gracias, Luis Felipe. Es, es una muy buena pregunta. A good question, but I don't think that is a technical question. It is a political question. How much does the state participate? Should it increase or not? That would depend on the beginning, on the, where the beginning point is. What I think has to happen is that the state has to be much more proactive in the productive sectors to create the conditions, what pa Paula was calling the new sectors, the new ideas, the new economies. And the other thing they have to undoubtedly do is do not comply with the 20th century deficits. Access to social protection, health, etc. can no longer wait. It, but this cannot happen if it is only a decision of the state. There has to be a social dialogue for this to be sustainable and be taken into account by all actors. So this is a political problem, a social dialogue one, and gracias, to have Rebecca, the Alicia. right conditions. Muchas gracias. gracias. Breve, Alicia? Creo que debe de ser un Thank social, no un Thank you. I think this should creo be a sí, social state, not an authoritarian a, state. A yes, the state relevante. must play a very relevant role, but it should be a representative government, not just for elites. Our societies are tired of the privileged culture, so we should have a culture of equality and equity, not just favoring sectors, certain sectors, and therefore policies should be more progressive, and as Joe said, there has to be accountability so that we do not come out of the crisis with more debt, hungrier and angrier, and that social anger should be channeled by a representative government. And I think that is where the key lies to, for the government to convoke or uh, call for this dialogue. Let's go to the next then. Gracias, Luis Felipe. Tenemos otra pregunta. Esta llega desde eh, de Víctor Falguera. No dice el país. Luis Felipe, this is Víctor Falguera. We don't know the country. In some claro, countries, he says, it is quite clear that the pandemic is showing a resurgence of an interest in rural areas, which normally have been disadvantaged areas regarding infrastructure and connectivity. So what are the specific elements in development strategies post-COVID to take advantage of this opportunity? that the pandemic is favoring the resurgence of the interest for rural areas traditionally disadvantaged in terms of infrastructure and connectivity. Which are the specific key elements in the post-COVID development strategies to size this opportunity? Luis Felipe. Thank you. Paula, given the, the uh, engagement that uh, the corporate world has uh, in, this, in these areas, would you like to say something about this? 
Yes, I agree um, with the question with Victor. I think the rural areas in Latin America are really a powerhouse for Latin America. And we can create more and better jobs and we should in, in these rural areas. Of course, we also need the help from governments in building infrastructure such as roads, no? Like let's have a road or a trail, a rain, a train, a railway when we, where we need it, no? Or, a, a communication capacity, no? This is a real industry that we have to explore and explode in a very interesting <clears throat> way. It creates better little towns of, um, you know, people that are traditionally tied to the, uh, to the land. And that is uh, a, a huge uh, benefit for, you know, these huge mega cities uh, in, in Latin America where, um, living has become almost impossible because of lack of or too much traffic or lack of services, et cetera. So we all, we definitely have to put our heads together and think how we make Latin America um, the silo of the world in the sense of, you know, the, the, the silo, no? the, the, the cereales and other uh, uh, agronomical uh, uh, crops. You know, relating to the previous uh, comment by Professor Stiglitz on the long term uh, and the idea how the government can actually focus on these long term investments to crowd in the, 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 the private investment uh, and perhaps also create institutional, uh, 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 you know, infrastructure for, for impact investment and for, and for the more socially oriented uh, private sector investments. Um, do you see development in this as, as an opportunity for development in these areas, Professor Stiglitz? Uh, yes. I mean, I, uh, let me say first, though, that that uh, uh, that uh, it's going to be important for Latin America to continue its transformation. This picks up what Carmen said. It's already too commodity uh, dependent. And so it really will have to continue with its, you might say, diversification, uh, its industrialization, uh, its moving to a service sector economy, tourism, lots of different areas. But it can't uh, just go back to uh, a rural uh, economy. And uh, one of the challenges is uh, how do you create urban environments which are safe and i do think that uh, one can do that and new york city has managed to get the incidence of the disease down uh, dramatically uh, but that requires some of the things that have already been talked about high levels of trust uh reliance on science and expert expertise those countries in latin america uh, and there are several who have uh, turned their back on science, on modernization, uh, are going, going to the rural areas, not going to solve their problem. They're going to be poorer five years from now, 10 years from now, uh, than they were uh, before the pandemic. So what the challenge for Latin America is to continue uh, its development strategy and accelerate it. Uh, rather than just going back uh, to the past. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if Carmen, if you would like to add something on this. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, first of all, on the rural versus urban, um, you know, there are going to be new urban challenges because it looks that this is, coming out in the next poverty report of the World Bank, that a lot of the new poor is, is urban poor. So, I mean, the, 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 the challenge ahead will also uh, involve dealing with, with the newly created poor, which tend to be more urban, tend to be more women, uh, uh, tend to be better educated than, than, than the traditional uh, um, poverty rates in but, but getting to the heart of the question, I, one concern I have, um, my co-author Graciela Kaminsky did many years ago uh, an interesting comparison 
uh, on how Asian countries, this is going back to the 1980s crisis, how Asian countries adjusted vis-a-vis -vis Latin American countries. Latin American countries took the ax literally to investment, to infrastructure investment and to in investment in, you know, public investment of, including education and it, it, public investment suffered disproportionately so uh, to, to other, you know, to government consumption disproportionately relative to, to Asia. Uh, I think, you know, in line of what Joe was also saying, you're thinking of a medium term strategy. You have to be very selective of, you know, uh, what trade-offs you make because you know, investment is always the discretionary variable. So it's easier to ax uh, in times of stress, but the medium term uh, consequences, you know, are, are, are also, uh, you know, quite substantive. Thank you, Carmen. Can we go to another question, please? Yes, um, thank you. Uh, this is from Jose Luis Martinez. Um, he says, Latin America and the Caribbean is in the middle of a, um, a very complex economic crisis. The investment in education and health um, historically has not been attended uh, in the right, uh, with the right levels of budget, which would be the mechanism in a short term to refloat, to recover the economy of the region taking into consideration that the internal uh, problems of the most of the nations in the region is corruption. Uh, José Luis dice, América Latina atraviesa una crisis económica muy compleja. Las inversiones en educación y salud no han sido... Saying the same thing I have just said, he is saying it in Spanish. So what would be the short-term mechanisms to make these economies come back, taking into account the fact that the internal problem in many of these countries is corruption? Uh, Jose Luis? I, um, uh, when I, go, I think uh, this is a question for also Alicia and perhaps Rebecca. Alicia, you have been talking about these issues recently. Sí, muchas gracias. Um, I would like to say that, uh, let, let me turn to English for a moment. Uh, I would like to say that governance is a very important issue. And I agree with, uh, with the question that corruption has been very high in the region and trust is missing. So we definitely need to move to more accountable transparency in terms of the, for example, the public expenditure and the public policies in general. So I really believe this is something that we need to move into very, very quickly. But before I leave the floor, uh, Luis Felipe, because I will have to disconnect, as you know, I just wanted to raise a very quick point that Joe Stiglitz raised before, and I think it's very important to, to see what the international community, and I think uh, taking the advantage that Carmen is also here, that I do agree that we have a risk of reprimarization and a risk of higher dependency on external financing. So what can be done and what's the type of collaboration and cooperation we need from the external uh, community? And basically a potential insolvency of the middle income countries. And I think we are a region of middle income countries and we don't see, I don't see yet in the responses in the DSSI, for example, the debt uh, initiative that has been put forward by G20 or the IFIs, I don't see yet how the middle income countries, particularly Central American economies and Caribbean economies, because we have also larger economies that can do better and have access to capital markets. But the Caribbean and the Central America, which have different problems, structural problems, how can we advocate uh, more uh, forcefully into a collaboration that we need uh, very, very strongly? So let me leave it there. I think SDRs is one. But most importantly, the lending capacity, the debt sustainability is something that we need to talk about in the region uh, collectively, I think. Thank you, Alicia, and thank you for your participation. Rebecca, I'll give the floor to you uh, um, on this issue of, of governance and, and corruption. So how we can build the trust given the recent uh, record in the region regarding you know, cases of corruption. Bueno, Luis Felipe, eh, eh, 
eh, hace muy poquitos días publicamos un artículo juntos precisamente sobre este tema. Ago, we published something jointly, and we said that no the problems and challenges we faced were not only economic, socioeconomic, no but also dudas, governance eh, problems. Dicho, and I have no doubt on what has been said that corruption does do away with confidence in public institutions and political systems. So to reach a fiscal reform when nobody trusts the institutions, it's almost impossible. So once again, it's the chicken and the egg pro problem. If we wait for everything to be fixed, then we won't do anything now, and it is now when we have to act. So this is why many of us have insisted on the social dialogue. In one way or another, the problem is to find solutions, not guilty people or institutions. And I think that we're usually trying to see who's guilty instead of finding the solution. The social dialogue has to have more transparent systems and much more accountability. I do sincerely think that technology can help us much in this area. There are systems that have been executed that allow much more transparency for governments in their spending. But the question continues to be, as Joe and, and Carmen said, what do we spend on and how? I insist there will be many opinions on this. It is not just one opinion on what to spend, how to spend it, and for whom we're spending. So that will require, I, will require, I insist, dialogues, coalitions, alliances, and at the end of the day, we will end in a new social contract because the previous one is not no longer possible to sustain. I am sure of this because I hope that those of us who do not add to the problems that we have, we have to avoid political crises in our countries through dialogue and consultations and coalitions. As a take home message uh, from you, and as you know, we at UNDP are relaunching our governance uh, program and we're working together. So thank you also for the trust and the collaboration. We're going to take uh, uh, 30 seconds for each of you, uh, the rest of the panelists, uh, to give us sort of a take home message because we have only uh, one minute left. Uh, so let's let's go very briefly, take home message from all of you, and then we can close. So uh, let's start with Paula. So Luis Felipe, listen, we're here to help, you know, to help create prosperity in Latin America. Um, we do it from our individual role. First of all, we have a responsibility with our employees, uh, making sure they are safe as well as their family. Secondly, in the communities where we operate, we, we have a very deep um, entrenched um, a muscle uh, that works together with communities. And third, from our role of small commerce in particular, we, you know, we have a role in reactivation in economic reactivation by bringing um, suppliers, more and more suppliers into our uh, chain, as well as little uh, up and down the street stores that are vital to all these communities in Latin America. So Luis Felipe, from our side as business, people, we will do our absolute best to help as much as we can to bring prosperity to Latin America fast and in an inclusive fashion. Thank you very much, Carmen. So I, I will take up on Alicia's point of, of, of the, what is the role of the multilateral? So I, I will grossly oversimplify given, given the time constraints, but I think a takeaway is you you do a lot of lending into the shock, you know, because this is they're walking into stepping in for the private sector in which lending has been limited and very costly. Uh, and if that means, you know, uh, expanding the resources via SDRs, uh, you know, allocations and so forth, this is this is then the short run. I do think, however, at some point you cross the Rubicon and, and many, or not uniformly, but many countries 
would be facing debt crises. At that point, you try to make the restructuring process as short and you know level the playing field to the extent you can uh, between debtors and creditors, including legislation and financial centers, uh, which can can you know level the playing field, you know moving moving to majority contracts, things that that are likely to shorten this. But the average historic uh, restructuring is over seven years, and it involves multiple tries. So we don't want to replicate that. Uh, so, so in a nutshell, short run, you fund the emergency, uh, medium term, prepare to help the restructuring process, facilitate the, uh, a better restructuring process than in the past. Thank you, Carmen. And uh... Finally, very brief message, Professor Stiglitz. Well, three brief messages. First, uh, we have to control the pandemic. That needs to be the first order of priority. And that requires uh, uh, generating trust, using uh, reliance on science and expertise. And too many countries in Latin America have failed in that critical test. Secondly, um, acting now in terms of the economy is critical. Uh, there are these hysteresis effects. Not doing it, uh, taking strong action now is going to have long lasting effects. Uh, it, uh, it, spending money now uh, is uh, what is needed. And thirdly, the multilateral development banks, the international financial institutions, have a critical role to play at this critical moment uh, in Latin America. And uh, the good news is, uh, to, to pick up Paula's uh, emphasis on optimism, uh, they've actually been doing a fantastic job. Thank you very much, Stellar Panel. It has been a lot of uh, uh, you know, food for thought. Also, we as UNDP engage in this dialogue in every country, we learn a lot from this conversation. Thank you to the CAF conference for giving us the opportunity again uh, to be here to discuss the challenges in the region. I give the, the floor back to our master of ceremony. Thank you, Luis Felipe. It is wonderful to see so much interest and engagement from our viewers. And with that, day one of the 24th CAF conference has concluded. I hope you agree that we have had a great first day. I would like to highlight how important is the challenge to control the pandemia, to rely on science and the economic growth. As our panel said, it should be built with green, social and inclusive concepts. And the sentence that I remember from our uh, a keynote speaker, the world should be free and open. That's the future. That was the sentence of uh, the president of Uruguay in this session, in this first day. Um, I want to thank our media partners, El País, America Economía, and NTN24. Um, we look forward to welcoming you tomorrow. We have three great sessions planned that uh, will address some of the challenges that we hear today. Also, the region's health system, climate change, and the role of technology in the economic recovery. In the meantime, feel free to explore the feature of our unique platform and network with fellow attendees. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for watching.